All right, if you have a Bible, do me a favor. Turn to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, we're going to pick up in chapter 14. 2 Chronicles is in the Old Testament. So about a, a, maybe a, a quarter of the way through your Bible, if you have one. So today we are continuing in a series where we're looking at the choices that we make in our life. And the reason why we're looking at the choices is that there's a truth that we keep using every single week. And it's this idea that every choice is a step toward a destination. What we're trying to get us to understand is that the, the end result of our life and the experience that we're having right now and the quality of life that we're having right now, it's not always just simply by happenstance. It's not an accident that the choices we make very much determines our quality of life, determines our experience. And we've acknowledged there are outliers to that. We realize you can make a many wonderful, healthy decisions and still have something unhealthy happen. But typically, and that's what we're looking at, typically the experiences of our life are directly tied to the choices we make. And so we've been looking at the kings of Israel. And the reason why we're looking at the kings is that their choices impacted not just their own life, but it impacted their families, it impacted the community, the nation in which they governed, it impacted future generations, it impacted their legacy. And so what we're seeing is that their choices had very powerful and direct results on those that were around them. And the reason why, again, we're looking at this is we want to learn from their experience. And so... If you've been a part of this series, here's what you know. It's been a pretty hard-hitting series. Can we agree to that? Kind of, you know, we probably could have called it toes because we just keep stepping on toes every week. Yeah, I know it wasn't good, but do you guys remember last week how not funny you were? Because I was great last week with my jokes. I need a little bit of participation. You know, you can show grace. It might not be the best jokes, but they're all I have, okay? But we're looking at this series. It's very hard hitting. And the first five weeks, including today, we're looking at the negative kings. We're looking at the kings who made bad decisions. Beginning in two weeks, we're going to start looking at the good week. So next week, we're going to pause the series for something special. But in two weeks, we're going to start to look at the positive kings of Israel and the choices that they made. But when we look at the negative and what we look at today, I want to just begin by saying this. And I mean this genuinely. Today's topic is very personal to me. It's personal to me on two levels. Uh, on the first level, it's personal to me just as a person, as a Christian who is striving to follow God, but it's also personal to me as a pastor. I know that God has given me a privilege, a privilege to be a leader, to in many ways to shape the culture of our church, to direct us where we're, we're heading. And here's what's very personal to me individually and then as a pastor. I want to individually, I want to finish strong in my life. I want to finish well. And what I mean by that is I want to live a life that honors God. And when my life comes toward the end or to the end, I want to be able to look back and not have regret that I made decisions that dishonored God, that ruined my reputation, that dishonored the kingdom of God or hurt the kingdom of God. And this is a legacy that matters to me. My grandfather passed away a few years ago, but, but he finished well. He, he was a pastor for over 50 years, lived this incredible life of integrity. And that's the example that I strive toward. His wife, my grandmother, is still alive. She's 90 years old. And she is still in the assisted living home that she lives, leading church, leading a Bible study, leading in worship, playing the piano, still honoring God. Even this past week, she wrote this most beautiful article. I shared it on my social media, but in case we're not friends, Google Betty Thompson, Assemblies of God News, okay? Google her and read the article about how God has given her a calling and she is going to follow that calling to the very end. That's the desire that I have for my life. But here's what I also have a desire for. I have a desire for you that I want you to finish well. I want you to experience the full blessing of God in your life. And, and the reason why this matters is because God has so much to offer us. And yet what I'm consistently seeing is people beginning a process that's drifting away from God. And I'll tell you, it's devastating. It's heartbreaking to me. And I would imagine it's heartbreaking to you. And whenever you see someone who at one point in their life had success and they make choices that bring destruction in their life, that's heartbreaking. But I think the most heartbreaking thing of all is watching people who at one time had a very vibrant and real relationship with God make choices that allow that relationship to die, where they walk away from God and they no longer are connected to him. And that's devastating. And, and I'll just be honest, 
It's something that I'm seeing more and more in the Christian church. Over COVID, the average church in our country lost 40% of the people who attended. So right now, even these percentages hold true, right now in America, churches are averaging 60% of what they did before COVID. That means 40% of the people who were connected in churches just a few years ago are no longer attending churches. And I can make the connection for the most part. Many of them are no longer in a relationship with God, no longer serving God. And, and we look at this, we go, why? How, how does this happen? Where people who once had a vibrant relationship don't with God. And here's the simplest of summaries. They quit doing the things that led them to success and they started doing things that led them toward destruction. And today when we look at, we're gonna look at three kings of Israel. This is their story. All three of the kings that we're going to look at today began their reign in 100% success. I mean, when you look at the beginning of their stories, it will actually be hard to imagine that their stories could end in anything but success because of how they began. But each one of them made decisions that led them away from God and ended in destruction for them as a king. And so what I want to do before we look at the three stories is I want to tell you the two foundational truths that you're going to see in every single story. And here's my heart. I've said this every single week. My hope, my prayer as I pray for these services every week is that each one of us will have an open heart, a humble heart that invites God to search our hearts and to show us the things in our life that we might be doing or thinking or desiring that can be leading us toward destruction. And then when God shows it, and, he, and I, I'm confident he will, when he shows us the things in our heart that need to change, that we will have the conviction to walk in obedience, to experience all that he has for us. And so here's the first truth that we're gonna see in all three stories. Godly success begins and continues by seeking God. You want to experience what God has for you? You want to honor God? It begins and continues by seeking God. But when I say that, I don't want you to think about it in the passive sense, which I think many Christians today make this mistake that they think because in their minds and in their hearts, they desire to honor God, that that's all it, it, it takes. I have a desire. I desire to honor God. I desire to connect to God. And that's all it takes. That is a passive response. The truth about seeking God is that seeking God is an active choice. If you want to seek after God, you have to make decisions in your life that will lead you deeper into the relationship with God. You have to make a decision to learn more and more about the nature of God. You can find these truths in his word. You need to make decisions where you can experience the presence of God in your life because his presence brings supernatural healing in your life. It brings empowerment in your life. It brings conviction in your life. But you have to make the choice to walk into environments where you can experience the presence of God in your life. When you decide to actively seek after God, that will always lead you to obedience. You need to understand this. There is no concept of disobedience when you are seeking God. By definition, disobedience is the opposite of seeking after God. It is leading you away from God. <clears throat> and so what we have to understand is in this active choice that we make, we must choose to go deeper into God. We must choose to walk in obedience but here's this next part about this. When you are seeking God, it will always lead you to pure worship. And what I mean about pure worship, there's two parts to that. It will lead you to first to destroy the idols in your life, the things that you have allowed to become a priority over God. And then it will lead you to take God and place him in his position that he deserves, the position of importance and authority in your life. And this will be a lifelong journey, a lifelong tension, that things will try to come up in your life to distract you, to become a priority. And those who want to seek after God in an active sense will be purposed to destroy the idols and to worship God with a pure heart. And so the first truth, godly success begins and continues by seeking God. But here's the second truth, and it's the opposite. Failure begins with pride. The moment your heart begins to pull away from your need of God, you're in a dangerous place. 
That that is the moment that you have began or begun a journey away from God. A, a journey that is heading toward destruction. And I think pride is, a, is kind of a, a sneaky thing. I think there's some subtle things that happen in our life that can reveal pride. I think the first one is fear. When we get afraid because life isn't going the way that we would hope it would go, when life doesn't go the way that we think it should go, when things feel out of our control and, and we start to feel that fear, what it can often lead us to do is to take control of things God never intended for us to take control of. Because we look at the pattern, and let me just ask you a kind of a vulnerable question. How many of you have ever experienced fear in your life? Will you just raise your hand? I mean, look at it, the, almost everyone in the room, if not everyone in the room. We have these moments where our plan, as we had hoped it would go in our life, all of a sudden it takes a different journey or a different pathway. All of a sudden we get a negative health report. All of a sudden, someone we love makes a decision that, that we didn't want them to make. All of a sudden, things get out of control from our perspective, and God doesn't operate in our timing and in our ways. And so what pride does, it says, you need to take control. Don't continue to trust God. Don't trust his timing. Don't trust his ways. Don't trust his power. You take control. And this is what we'll see in the story. These kings, their hearts welled up in pride, and it led them away from God. But the second subtle thing that exposes pride in our life is success. That the more we have success in our life, the more we enjoy life, the more we can buy into our own hype. And we start to decrease in our own minds and hearts our need for God and our dependence upon God. And we start to think, you know what? I'm okay. Life is okay. I can do this on my own. And what we'll see in every single one of these stories as pride welled up in their hearts, it always led them away from God. Because seeking God always leads you in the right direction, and pride always leads you toward destruction. There is no exception to that rule. And so the first king we're going to look at today, his name is Asa. And like I said before, if you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 14. And this is how Asa's reign began. This is how he was described. And Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the ashram. So where he began is the destruction of idols. These were actual physical things that the nation had set up to worship other gods besides the true God. And so he tears them down. He destroys them and commanded Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, and to keep the law and commandment. He also took out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the incense altars, and the kingdom had rest under him. So here's what you see. This is a, a very simple description of where his reign began. He first was seeking God. He, he made it the priority of his life. I'm gonna seek after God. He led the nation in pure worship to the, the destruction of idols commanding them to seek after God. He commanded them to walk in obedience. And so again, it's just this rhythm, seeking God, obeying God, pure worship. Seeking God, obeying God, pure worship. And what was the result? And the kingdom had rest under him. God supernaturally blessed them so that they would have rest. And you need to understand why rest matters. When a nation doesn't have a threat from another nation, they're able to grow in prosperity. While they have rest, they're able to plant their crops and to harvest their crops. Their men can focus on that versus going to war. They'll increase in population because their men and boys would not die in battle. They're able to fortify their cities. They're able to just in every way grow in strength and prosperity. And so Asa, because of the choices he made, God gave him supernatural blessing. And so as they were building in strength and in wealth, this other nation came to oppose them, the Ethiopians, and it was led by their king, Zerah. And Zerah came against them with a far superior army. His army, as tells us in scripture, had one million men and 300 chariots. And chariots were the most devastating form, a weapon in battle. And so they came, a far superior force came against them. And so Asa knew that just if they were comparing their armies, that they were in a very negative situation. So do you know what Asa did? He did what he should have done. He prayed. In 2 Chronicles 14, 11, this is what it says. And Asa 
cried to the Lord his God. O Lord, there is none like you to help between the mighty and the weak. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rely on you. And in your name we have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are God, let not man prevail against you. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa, in his own strength, knew that we couldn't compete, where they'll destroy us. And so he went to God and he just prayed this simple and beautiful prayer. God, I need you. We need you. You're the only one that can do this. You're the only one that can save. And so do you know what God did is he answered them and he delivered them. And they were able to go against this far superior army and to defeat them. And not only to destroy them, but to destroy all the nations that they represented. And as a result of that, they were able to increase even more in wealth because they were able to go in, destroy and to loot and take all of the the rewards of war back home. And so Asa, after this destruction and this victory that God gave him, he comes back and this prophet comes to him and says, hey, I just want to remind you of what you just experienced. What you just experienced is this rhythm. If you seek after God, you will find God. If you honor God, God will honor you. If you're faithful to God, God will be faithful to you. If you trust in God, God will bless you. Just walks them through this. Just note what you experienced. God will be faithful if you seek after God. And here's how Asa responded. He responded beautifully. As soon, this is in chapter 15, verse eight. As soon as Asa heard these words, the prophecy of Azariah, the son of Oded, he took courage and put away the detestable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities that he had taken in the hill country of Ephraim. And he repaired the altar to the Lord that was in front of the vestibule in the house of the Lord. So he continues this process of the destruction of idols, even in the new lands that they have. And he, just, he takes down all the idols because he's continuing to lead the people in pure worship of God. Verse nine, and he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those from Ephraim and Manasseh and Simeon who were residing with them for great numbers had deserted to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord, his God was with them. So if you were here last week, I I told you that the nation of Israel had divided at this point. So Asa is leading Judah, but men and women and families from Israel, when they saw the blessing of God on Judah, they left Israel to come to be with him. And so he gathered up all the people who had a heart to worship and to serve God. And he gathered them all together. And they gathered at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of the reign of Asa. They sacrificed to the Lord on that day from the spoil that they had brought, 700 oxen, 7,000 sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart, with all their soul, But that whoever would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, should be put to death, whether young or old man or woman. They swore an oath to the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with horns. So they had a powerful worship service. And all Judah, this entire nation, rejoiced over the oath, for they had sworn with all of their heart and had sought him, God, with with their whole desire. And he was found by them. And the Lord gave them rest all around. So once again, you just see this rhythm. And and I would challenge you, you will not see an example in scripture different than this, that when you seek after God, you find God. And when you seek after God, God blesses you. So he removes from them the threat of war. Asa would go on and even remove his own mother from a position of authority as queen because she created an altar to a false God. So he really did purify the nation And God gives them decades of rest, probably about 30 years of rest. So no battles. And during this time, they increase in prosperity and wealth. The army grows. They grow in military might. And then on the 36th year of his reign, the army of Israel, partnering with Syria, comes against Judah. And he has a moment where, once again, he's about to face a far superior army. So this is not a trick question. What should Asa do or what should he have done? Pray, Pray, right? I mean, the last time he faced an army of a million men, 300 chariots, far superior. And he goes to God with a heartfelt prayer and he invites God to do a supernatural work and God does. This is what he should have done. He should have gone and pray. But instead what he did, because pride had welled up in his heart, is he bought off Syria. He sent money to them and said, will you break your covenant relationship with Israel? And they did. 
And so it actually worked. His plan worked. And then when he comes back from this success, he's confronted by a prophet. And the prophet challenges him because his behavior just dishonored God. And here's what the prophet says, 2 Chronicles 16, 7. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, because you relied on the king of Syria and did not rely on the Lord your God, the army of, the, army of the king of Syria has escaped you. I want to pause. It was God's desire in this season and in this moment to destroy Syria. They were a wicked nation that would constantly torment Israel. You will see as a result of his decision that his son will have to face the consequence of that behavior. But this prophet says, I don't know why you doubted God, why you tried to do it on your own. God had been faithful to you. He goes on and says, we're not the Ethiopians. He's referring back to that story 35 plus years ago. We're not the Ethiopians and the Libyans, a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen. Yet because you relied on the Lord, he gave them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. You have done foolishly in this. For from now on, you will have wars. You had 30 years of peace. Now you're going to have wars because you didn't trust in God. And so the prophet comes and he confronts him. So he already has pride. He made a bad decision. He's now confronted in his sin. So you know what he does? Is he has the prophet arrested, taken away and tortured. His heart starts to grow dark and he starts to mistreat the people he was called to lead through service. So God allows him to become diseased and his feet to get his attention and the reason why God did this, he did it with multiple kings, that he would allow them to experience sickness, but every king who repented, God supernaturally healed. God was once again just trying to get his attention, but this is what it says in verse 12, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa was dise diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet, even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help from physicians. This is the decline of, of King Asa. Remember where it began was this incredible testimony of seeking God, of obeying God, of pure worship to God. But what we see in his life is that pride led him not to seek God in the battle. And why is that? Well, there's a couple of reasons that are possible. One is maybe in fear, he said, I have to do this myself. He forgot about God and, and all these years of peace and he just felt the fear and he goes, you know what? I'm gonna take control back. I have to do this myself. I have to figure out a way. Or maybe it was just the opposite. Maybe an arrogance and the pride led him to say, you know what? I can do it myself. I have the power. In 30 years, I've increased in wealth and I've increased the in military might. And so I'm just gonna do it my way. I could ask God, but then God might lead us to actually go out to battle and I don't wanna do that, so I'm just gonna use the money. And so pride led him away from obedience to God. But then when he was confronted, pride led him to not receive that correction. He took the voice of conviction, the prophet, and he had him silenced, taken away into prison to be tortured. And this is the same temptation that happens in every single one of our lives. When we are walking in obedience to God and we know what we should be doing, when we make the decision not to serve God and to start to walk in disobedience, what naturally happens in our lives is we remove either ourselves from the voices or the voices from our lives, those who will speak truth to us, those who will be a convicting force in our lives, and we create separation because we don't want to hear the truth because we know in our hearts what we should be doing. And so in pride, we pull away from church and we pull away from relationships where people will speak truth and we pull away from small groups and we pull away from doing our devotions and we pull away from experiencing the presence of God. Why? Because we don't want the voice of conviction in our life. And this is what Asa did. He said, I'll just silence the voice. And then when God sent sickness to him where he could have repented, received supernatural healing from God, humbled himself, he just allowed himself to become more and more bitter and he went after physicians and he never turned back to God. And this is the end of his story. He dies. I want you to think about it. I said the same thing a few weeks ago when I was talking about Solomon. But early on in Asa's life, when he was experiencing the blessing of God and he was walking in obedience, I would imagine if you or I had the opportunity to talk to him and we were to ask him, 
Can you envision any scenario where at the end of your life, you're no longer serving God? He would say, impossible. But what happened? He quit doing the things that were healthy and started doing the things that led to destruction. Pride welled up in his heart. And so he dies and his son Jehoshaphat becomes king, which I'm just going to pause and acknowledge. I think is the coolest name in scripture. Jehoshaphat. I mean, if I go back in time, I would be tempted to name my kid this. But he makes some mistakes, and so I'm not going to do that. Okay. But here's what I would say. This is a little bit of a disclaimer. I actually think Jehoshaphat, though, in the end of his life, he makes a bad decision. I think overall he was a, he was a good king and he honored God. But it's just he, his life ends with a mistake, and that's why we're looking at his story. But here's where his story begins. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 3 says, The Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the earlier ways of his father David, He did not seek the Baals, but sought the God of his father and walked in his commandments and not according to the practices of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought tribute to Jehoshaphat and he had great riches and honor. His heart was courageous in the ways of the Lord. And furthermore, he took the high places and ashram out of Judah. He did the exact same things, the good things that his father had done when he was seeking God. He sought after God. He obeyed God, taught the nation to obey God. He led them in pure worship, the destruction of idols, true authentic worship to God. This was his story. And so God blesses him, even though he'll make mistakes. And one of the first things it tells us is he does make a mistake. It's a story that I'm just gonna paraphrase to you, but it's one of my favorite stories in scripture, is that for whatever reason, he begins to partner with the king of Israel, who's a wicked man. His name's Ahab. And he begins to partner with him. And and Ahab says, hey, will you go with me in battle against Syria? So at this point, Syria should have already been destroyed by his father, but he hadn't. So he says, will you go with me to battle? And so King Jehoshaphat, who does serve God, goes, well, before we go to battle, can we ask to see if there's a prophet that can speak for God to tell us if whether or not we should do this? And so he says, yeah, sure. And so he calls in his false prophets, Ahab, and his false prophets. I mean, this is a group of clowns. Like These guys come in, and they're like, oh, king, go to battle. You will be successful. Do whatever your heart desires. I mean, they're just telling him what he wants to hear. And Jehoshaphat can tell, like, this isn't authentic. And he goes, well, do you have anyone that actually hears from God? And this is what King Ahab says. This is literally, I'm quoting what he says. He goes, there is this one prophet, but I hate him because he never says anything good about me. (laughs) Can Can you relate to that a little bit? He's like, I don't want that voice in my life. And he goes, no, call for this guy. And so they send a messenger and the messenger goes to this prophet Micaiah and says, they want you to come and speak. But he goes, before you come, know this, all the other prophets, they have spoken favorably. And so you need to match what they say. And Micaiah goes, that's not how it works. He says, I will only say what God speaks to me. And so he comes into the room and King Ahab goes, tell us, should we go to battle? And he goes, and I I love this prophet because he's a smart aleck. Like I can relate to this guy. So he goes, tell us, should we go to battle? And he goes, absolutely. You should totally go to battle. It's going to be awesome. Go to battle. And he goes, how many times do I have to tell you to tell me the truth? That's what the king says to him. And he goes, okay, fine. You want to know the truth? Here's what I actually saw. All the nation of Israel were scattered on the mountains as sheep without a shepherd because you were killed in battle. And God said that he was going to send and allow a spirit to come and speak a deceiving word to all of your false prophets because you're not seeking God. And if you follow their instructions, you're going to go to battle and you're going to die. And when he says this, the other false prophet walks over and strikes him and says, when did the spirit of God leave me and and speak to you? And he goes, here, this is how you'll know. When you find yourself scared and in hiding because the, the army was destroyed, And if this king who I just prophesied would die, if he comes back alive, then here's what you know. I didn't hear from God. And so they ignore this prophet of God and they go to battle. And King Ahab manipulates Jehoshaphat. And I don't know why he fell for this, but Syria wanted to kill King Ahab, the king of Israel. So the king of Israel convinced Jehoshaphat to wear his clothes out to battle. Again, I don't know why he fell for that. He's like, you're going to wear the king of Israel's clothes. You're going to go out to battle. We're going to come. I'm going to dress in common clothes. And so they go out to battle. And I'm, just, I'm going to continue to paraphrase this story just for time. So they go out to battle. And while they're in battle, Syria begins to conquer. And Syria gets closer and closer to Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, in this moment, comes to the realization that he's made a mistake. And he prays to God, God, will you save me? And God delivers him. And when God delivers them, he allows the opposing army to realize he's not the king of Israel. They then go off in a different direction. And this is what scripture says. 
that after they pull away and they start to go in a different direction, a random archer just pulls out an arrow, fires it in the air, and it goes and it hits the king of Israel between his armor and kills him. That the prophecy that Micaiah proclaimed came to pass. The king of Israel dies. And so when Jehoshaphat comes back, a prophet confronts him and goes, why would you ever join yourself with a wicked king of Israel? He says, yet God still sees good in you. Jehoshaphat had a humble heart. And so he began to continue to reign. And, and he, we don't see it in scripture, but we can assume he responded in repentance and God begins to bless him and he reigns. But then he is faced with another situation, another opposing army, the Moabites and the Ammonites come against Judah. And when they come against Judah, Jehoshaphat leads the nation once again in the right way. And he calls for a prayer in a time of fasting. And he says, we need to seek God because if we don't, these, these armies are going to come and they're going to destroy us. And while they, as a nation, were worshiping God and seeking God, the prophet comes and speaks to him and goes, here's what God is saying to you. He's going to fight this battle for you. You won't even have to lift an arm. You won't have to fight at all, but God still wants you to march out in battle. And so when they hear this word, they go and they march out in battle and they rejoice. They believe God. They have faith. And here's what scripture tells us. I love this. They began to worship. And what I love about this, they worshiped before they had the victory. And friends, hear me. If you face an opposing situation that's greater than you, here's a, the greatest habit you could ever develop, to worship God before you get the victory to truly believe in your heart that God has the power to provide what you need in your life. And they begin to worship. And scripture tells us, literally says this, the moment they began to worship, God caused the other nations to have confusions. These two armies turned on each other and they destroyed each other, killing each other, all of them. And so as the nation of Judah marched out to battle, when they crossed over the hill and they came to this specific spot, all they saw were dead men, the destruction of both armies. And for three days, there was such destruction that for three days, they went and they collected the spoil of war. It took them three days to collect it all. And on the fourth day, they began to worship God again. They worshiped before the victory. They worshiped after the victory. Powerful story. In that moment, if you would have gone to Jehoshaphat and said, can you envision a time in your future where you're going to disobey God? What do you think his response would have been? No way. I've seen God move. God has given us victory. God has been faithful. God has given prosperity. There's no way. And yet at the end of his life, it simply tells us this story, that once again, he partners with the next wicked king of Israel. And he partners with them to build ships to send out. Doesn't tell us the why. Many speculate they were gonna send these ships out to collect gold, to increase in wealth. But he partnered once again and disobeyed God once again by partnering with a wicked king of Israel. And so God speaks through a prophet and says, because you disobeyed me, all the ships will be destroyed. And they were, they were all destroyed. What happened in his heart is that pride welled up and here's what he said in his heart. I can do what I want. I know God told me not to partner with a wicked king of Israel, but I can do what I want. And friends, this is the pride that grips so many hearts in our culture. I can do what I want. We are being trained to think this way in an American mindset. That in our country, we are consumers. We have money. We, have, we live in the most prosperous nation in the history of prosperous nations. We have money. Culture is telling us that because we have money, we're the customer. Customer's always right. People need to work to make us happy. Our culture is telling us that we have the ability to create our own standards, to create our own reality, to create our own truth, that everything is about if it feels good, do it. And so what we have been trained in and convinced in is I can do what I want. And when we enter into a relationship with God, we must surrender that mindset. But Jehoshaphat didn't. And it led him to, again, I don't know that he'd be considered a bad king but what I know is a simple thing. The end of his life in the scriptures is one paragraph and it says he united with the wicked king of Israel. He disobeyed God and God destroyed the ships. But that's his legacy. The same thing can be true in our life when we have a heart that says, God, I know what you command. I know what you want me to do, but I can do what I want. The moment we have that mindset, we are on a pathway toward destruction. And then the last king, who comes a few generations later. His name is Uzziah. 
And Uzziah really didn't have much said about him. It's a very short account of his life. But there are two sentences in his account that I pray just burn into your brain and heart. It says this in 2 Chronicles 26, verse 4. And Uzziah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He set himself to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of the Lord. Just pause there. Zechariah was a prophet, so he was seeking after God, dedicated to the instructions of this prophet, was following him in obedience. So you can look at him just like all the other kings. He is seeking after God. But then there's this one sentence that I hope burns into your, your mind and heart. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. And so he sought God and God gave him peace. And they were, it was such a time of peace that they increased in wealth, they increased in military might. It actually describes them that they were a very creative culture that invented new forms of weaponry to go to battle with. So again, success from God in every way. But then this is what it says about his life later. Verse 16, but when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. And that's the other sentence I want to burn into your mind and heart. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. And what did he do? It says, for he was unfaithful to the Lord, his God, and entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. That might not seem like a big deal, but God made it so that in their temple, only the, the priests, the Levites and the sons of Aaron, the descendants of Aaron, could go into the most holy place and to burn incense before God. And he, for whatever reason, the pride in his heart welled up. And, and this is what his pride told him. I can worship God however I want to worship God. God doesn't have a right to tell me how to worship him or not. The Levites don't have a right to tell me how to worship God or not. I can worship God however I want to worship God. And so he goes into the temple and the priests in, in absolute courage block him. And they said, King, we can't let you go in. And they really saved his life because if he would have gone in there, God would have struck him dead. And they save his life and he keeps arguing in the midst of arguing as he's holding the incense to, that he wants to give before God, his forehead breaks out in leprosy, a skin condition. And the priests rush him out and he never repents. And this is how he ends his life. He never once again steps foot into his own palace. He gets separated into his, another house because he had leprosy. And he never once again goes into the temple to worship God. Isolated from community, isolated from his kingdom, isolated from God because he would not repent. And the pride in his heart said, I can worship God however I want to worship God. And you know what? That's the same pride that leads so many people away from God. God says, I'll tell you how to worship me. You're gonna worship me through pure worship. You're gonna destroy the idols in your life. You're gonna put me as a priority. You're gonna walk in obedience. You're gonna worship me in the context of community. God designs us to be a body. God designs us to serve. He designs us to give financially. He designs us to, to connect with other people, to hold them accountable, allow them to hold us accountable, to encourage them, to be encouraged, to love them, to be loved. God designs us in so many different ways, commands us in so many different ways of what worship will look like. And yet in our culture, we go, you know what? I'm gonna worship God however I want to worship God. And the reason why this is so devastating is their story can very much be our story. When we look at them, they're not the exception to the rule. They're the example. The reason why God put this in the word of God so that we could see it and learn from it. So here's my question as I conclude today. As we look at our lives, what is our story? What's your story right now? If you had a moment of reflection where you're looking at your life, only you know this, you and God. Are you seeking God? Is God genuinely the priority in your life? Is he the passion of your life? Or are you walking in obedience when God speaks to you and you know the truth? Are you responding in obedience or disobedience? Do you have pure worship of God? Are you perpetually going through the process of saying, God, search my heart, show me the idols that I need to tear down so I can place you as the priority? So here's the question I want you to just wrestle with today and this week. What will be the end? 
As you look at your story, what will be the end? If it's true what we're looking at in this series, that every choice is a step toward the destination, what choices are you making right now and where are they leading? You can say in your mind and heart, I desire to honor God. I desire to end well. I desire to experience eternity with God. But what choices are you making now that are leading you on the pathway toward that destination? Because if you're not seeking God, then the only alternative is you've allowed pride to well up in your heart and you're on a pathway toward destruction. And so if you're not seeking God, are, are these some of the things that are welling up in your heart? I don't need to seek God like I used to. I see that probably as the most common sin, the most common mistake that people make that leads them on this slow fade away from God. And I want you to hear my heart. This genuinely breaks my heart. I've been a pastor for 23 years. And in that time, I've seen families, I've seen couples, individuals. I've had close personal friends that at one point had a vibrant relationship with God. And they just quit doing the things that made them healthy. They just, in their hearts, said, I, I don't need to see God like I used to. They actually started to buy in an idea like, I'm okay. I'm doing all right. It's not a big deal. And so where they once went to church every time the doors were open, that turned from four times a month to three times a month to two times a month to one time a month to just periodically to rarely to never. And what do we do in our hearts? Is church attendance a priority? Because we do believe that we are called to be the body of Christ. And coming together and worshiping is something we're commanded to do. In Hebrews, it says, forsake not the gathering. Don't make that a non-priority in your life. Does church attendance matter? Does reading the Bible matter? Does serving in church matter? Does connecting in purpose relationships in some type of small group with individuals that are walking toward Christ together, does that matter? Does giving financially matter because it entrusts your heart and your provision to God? These things that God clearly gives us in his word, are we saying in our hearts, well, I don't need that. I'm the exception to that rule. Is the pride that's welling up in your heart one that says, I'm afraid to trust God, so I'll do it myself? God's timing is just different. His ways are different. It's not our preference. And so we say, oh, God, I know how you want me to raise my kids, but I'm going to do it my way. I know how you want me to act in my dating relationships. I'm going to do it my way. I know how you want me to treat my spouse, but I'm going to do it my way. I know what you want in my finances and in my job. I'm going to do it my way. Is that what pride is leading you to do? Is pride of your heart saying, I can worship God however I want. I can make him a priority when I want and, when, and not when I want. Is a pride of your heart saying, I don't need correction. I don't wanna submit myself to any type of spiritual authority. I don't wanna submit myself to another relationship where someone might speak truth to me. I don't need correction. I'm a power under myself. Because all of these things that we see in the story of these kings, I see in the lives of people every single day. And do you know who else's life I see it in? My own life. And I don't, I don't say this to be dramatic. I don't say this just to, to make me sound different. But here's the truth, and this is genuine truth. I am weak. I am weak on my own. That was Pastor Brandon's word this morning, the call to worship. On my own, here's the truth. I am weak. I need the systems that God has put in my life to keep me walking toward God. And here's what I know. I mean this genuinely. I love God with everything that is in me. It is the passion of my life to love God and to serve God. And yet, even with that passion in my heart, if I don't have the systems in place, my heart will wander away from God. And so I am thankful that I have men and women around me that I serve with, that encourage me, that hold me accountable. I'm thankful that I have the privilege of teaching every week, forces me to consistently be in the word of God. I'm thankful that I've developed rhythms and habits in my life, that I wake up every morning to do my devotions, to spend time with God, to recenter my focus. I'm thankful that I've developed the habits in my life of, of giving to God and my finances, of serving God in ministry, because all of those things are needed to keep me healthy. Because I am not the exception to the rule, I am the rule. 
If I don't have those things, my heart will wander away from God. When I am actively seeking God, I walk toward success, I walk toward his blessing. When pride wells up in my heart, I walk toward destruction. And friends, the last thing I wanna give you before I pray for you, there will never be a moment in your physical life where you will need God less. There's no amount of success, no amount of discipline that you can muster up in your life that you will get to a point where you need God less. What, how you needed God on your worst day is how you need him every day. The desperation that you need to have in your mind and heart is, I will not survive without God today. And when we lose sight of that, pride wells up and we walk toward destruction. Will you bow your heads? I want you to think about your life right now. I want you to think about the choices that you make, the choices you're making in your life. And I, I just want you to ask yourself, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal this to you. Where are the choices leading you right now? Not where do you desire to be, but where are the choices you're making right now? Where are they leading? If you find yourself becoming more casual in your faith, where's that leading? If you find your discipline decreasing, where's that leading? If you find yourself allowing sin to become more of your life where you compromise a little bit here and you're compromising a little bit there. Where do those choices lead? And as you look at that pathway, ask God to show you what he wants and then surrender your heart to him. God, we're so thankful that you're a God who never leaves us alone. You're not indifferent toward our sin. You're not indifferent toward our destruction. You're a passionate father who is defending your children. So God, I ask you, I beg you to challenge us to convict us of our sin, to show us what's not pleasing to you, never to shame us, but so that we will understand what needs to be changed so that we can experience the fullness of the life that only you offer. Help us to see past the deception and lies of our culture to realize the only truth is you're the giver of life, the sustainer of life. You're the one who supernaturally blesses and you're the one that ultimately is gonna lead us toward eternal life. Help us to trust in you, help us to be obedient. And to you, we give all the glory. And we pray this in your precious name, amen.